Well, you've been seating for a while. Let's turn in our Bibles tonight as we stand together to the book of Esther for just a few minutes. The book of Esther. It's raining too hard to go anywhere. So uh, let's just stay here for a little preaching tonight. The book of Esther, chapter number 6. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. Good to see all of you tonight. Thank you for being here in the Lord's house this evening. That's, uh, <clears throat> Brother Earl said a few minutes ago, it's exactly right, it's a family. And uh, appreciate you and love you and appreciate you coming out tonight to be a part of our services here in the Lord's house. Esther chapter 6, uh, verse number 1. On that night could not the king sleep. And he commanded to bring the book of records of the Chronicles. And they were read before the king. Drop down to verse 3. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Now, Lord, I love you tonight. I thank you for these few moments that we have together this evening. I thank you, Lord, for the good singing tonight. I thank you for those who practiced and prepared themselves to bless our hearts with the good music. Thank you, Lord, for the good music. Thank you, Father, for the hymns that mean something that stir our hearts, stir the chords of our heart, and speak to us. Now, Lord, I pray for these few moments that we may be able to be challenged from your word as you speak to us tonight. And meet with us, we pray, in a special way. Any need tonight or needs that, is, that are present, uh, Lord, point those needs out to us, we pray, through the Holy Spirit of God. And help us to yield to what the Spirit of God would lead us to do. And we'll thank you for it, because we ask in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you. Weekend Haman has done all in his ability uh, to take the life of Mordecai. He has devised a plan where all of the Jews in the 127 providences will be killed on a specific day. Esther gets word of it from Mordecai, and she begins to make preparations to stop the slaughter of the Jewish people. You know, it's amazing when I think about that. We had the privilege this week in Washington, D.C. of going through, on our way out of town, going through the Holocaust Museum. If you're ever in the city of Washington, D.C., I would challenge you to go through the Holocaust Muse Museum and look at the history uh, of the tragedy that's been brought to bear upon the Jewish nation. It's, it's beyond our ability to comprehend that people who belong to the human race could do something so tragic as taking the lives of so many millions of God's people. One of the scenes there showed those Jews that had been slain on the ground and a bulldozer bulldozing their bodies over in a trench and covering them up. They sent them in this large uh, a large uh, uh, home or large building and led them there with a belief system that something else would be taking place and they herded them like cattle downstairs into a large room and a German soldier stood on top of that uh, roof and put some type of cyanide tablet, tablets down the chimney. And he came out downstairs and the Jews in a few minutes that were in that room, hundreds of them were killed. They'd stack them on carts like cordwood and throw them in furnaces and, and burn their bodies. But before they would do that, they would take them in a side room and put them on a table with a hole in the middle of it for the blood to run out. They would take instruments and pull their teeth and get the gold and the silver out of their teeth and the valuables that they had. And then they would take them in these furnaces and they would burn their bodies in the furnaces and they did that 24 hours a day to the tune of millions of Jews being killed, and they tried to exterminate them. The devil has for centuries tried to destroy 
the Jewish nation. And the reason being is the Jewish nation gave us the Bible. The Jewish nation gave us the Savior. And it is the Jewish nation that God will seal in the last book of the Bible to, to the tune of 144,000 to preach the kingdom message again right here upon this earth. And the devil knows that through the offspring of the Jewish nation that uh, he will have the final death kill placed upon his life. So the devil hates the Jew, and he's done all in his diabolical power to try to destroy them. Here is a man by the name of Haman who is, who is set on destroying the Jewish nation. Now Queen Esther finds out about it, and she gets an audience with the king. She realizes that she can be slain just by walking into his presence, but he raises his scepter, and she walks and touches the scepter and gets the audience of the king. And she invites the king and Mordecai and Haman uh, to a banquet that uh, she's going to put, uh, put on for them. And they come together, and, uh, and the king says, What can I do for you, even up to the half of my kingdom? And she said, King, here's what I want you to do. I want you to meet again tomorrow night. And tomorrow night, I will tell you what you can do for me. Now, out of that meeting strutted Haman over to his house. And in the last part of the fifth chapter of the book of Esther, he goes home and he brags about all of the glory pertaining to him, beginning in verse 11 of chapter 5. He brags about his children, and he brags about the fact that he's been promoted. And he brags about the fact that no one else outside of the immediate uh, king and the queen uh, has been invited into these special parties. And so as a result of that, uh, he brags about uh, the next meeting and what's going to take place. And he literally believes uh, that uh, he's in good standing with the king and with the queen. And he has no idea of what that next banquet is going to consist of when it takes place on tomorrow night. Now, that's where we got to last week. Now, tonight in the sixth chapter, we notice that uh, it's the night before the next banquet. And something strange is, is, is happening in the sixth chapter in verse number one. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is the providence of God once again kicking in. Of all of the nights that this king could not sleep, it would have to be on this night. I want you to understand, that's not by accident. God is in the arrangements. I want you to understand that throughout the providence, all of the providences, 127 providences, most of the people have done pillowing their head, looking eternity in the face, and they're sleeping in their homes. There's no doubt that Haman is sleeping in his house. There's no doubt that Mordecai is asleep. There's no doubt, probably, that Queen Esther is asleep. But there's one person in the capital city that cannot sleep. Happens to be the king. The king is up, and he's walking the floor. And God is beginning to move in this situation. It's about the 11th hour. And God is going to move in this situation. The Bible says in verse number 1 that when he could not sleep, that he had the, the, the chamberlains uh, and uh, the servants... Uh, to bring the chronicles into his presence. Now, we might say that he's asking for the minutes of the kingdom to be brought into his presence. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think if, if I was having problems sleeping, I wouldn't want the minutes of anything read to me. Uh, one, re one way you can go to sleep when you can't sleep, start reading the Bible. And boy, that'd get you to sleep quick. The devil don't like it because you read the Word. So he sins for the minutes of the previous cabinet meetings. And the servant comes in and uh, begins to read, verse number 2, about uh, the bygone days there in the kingdom. And as he reads down through the previous minutes, uh, something comes up that he had literally forgotten about. If you'll notice, in verse number 2, they rehearse the story of the two people in the kingdom who had determined to take the life of the king. And Mordecai had found out about it. And Mordecai had gone through the right channels and got the message to the king. And they sent out their FBI to search out these two guys just to find out if, in fact, they were going to take 
the, the life of the king, and it was found, yes, that's their plan, to take the king's life. So before they had the opportunity to do so, the king had those two people assassinated through the night. Now, if you remember previously when we talked about this, something strange happened. It was Haman that got exalted in the kingdom, but Mordecai still retained his same position. And evidently, the king had forgot about Mordecai saving his life. He hadn't exalted him. And so, in verse number 3, the king said, let me ask you a question here. I remember this. I remember when Mordecai uh, uh, told me about these, uh, sent word to me about these two guys trying to take my life. Now he said to this chamberlain, he said, I've got a question for you. Read on down through there and let's determine as to whether or not we have rewarded Mordecai for saving my life. And as they read down through there, they find out that in fact they have not rewarded him for uh, saving the life of the king. Now, you know, uh, this might have happened to you in a little different respect. You might go down on the job and you might give the best you've got. And I believe Christians do that. I believe it's right for Christians to do that. If there's anybody on the job that ought to give a full day's work, uh, it ought to be a Christian. Ought to give, if they work eight hours, they ought to give eight hours. Uh, take the breaks and the lunch period out, but I think a Christian ought to go down there and give their best to the person that pays their salary. I, I just believe that's biblical. As a matter of fact, the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians teaches us that, that Christians ought to give a good day. By the way, by the way, that's a testimony to Christianity. It's not a good testimony to Christianity when somebody's on the clock and they kill all the time. It's not a good, it's not a good testimony. So, you've, you've probably been there. You've probably, Watch people around you get exalted in a position. Maybe they're sinful, and maybe they go out with the boss, and maybe they go out to the drinking parties at Christmas time, and because of that, they get the good positions while you are looked over. But I want you to understand something tonight. There's a great story here that really should get our attention this evening. And it is this. God is keeping count. God is looking on, and God will take care of the situation. Just be faithful. Be faithful to the Lord. God will see to it that in time you will get recognized. God will see to it that in time he will honor you. Now, Mordecai, Mordecai was not a person of vengeance here. Now, he's had opportunities to do something to Haman, but the Bible doesn't say anything about it. He never tried to get back at him. Uh, he just uh, left it in the hands of the Lord. He did the best he could. And he went on and served in his position at the gate of the city the, to the very best of his ability. Thinking about the book of Hebrews, chapter number 6 and verse number 10. The Bible says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God, God's looking at you. You folks that get discouraged and you see that worldly crowd. Man, it's tough out there today. You see that worldly crowd around you? They don't have time for God. Weekends is out of the question when it comes to going to church. Uh, prayer's out of the question. Serving God's out of the question. They get their kicks out there with a, with a six-pack and going to the ABC store and dr having their drinking parties uh, with the people they work with and going out and doing the things of the world. They get their kicks at that. And you go down there and you labor and you give your best and you try to be a good Christian. You try to be a good testimony. And you don't uh, get recognized. You just hold on. You just keep doing what you're supposed to do. I want to tell you something. Several things. Number one, God will look after you. And the second thing is, that crowd that's around you that don't appreciate you right now, you just wait till cancer kicks in. Uh, you just wait until tragedy comes in their family. They're not going to go to the crowd they drink with. When tragedy comes in their family, <clears throat> they're not going to go to the worldly crowd and ask them to pray for them. They're going to go to you because they've got confidence in you because you've been faithful in your job and in your position where you work, serving the Lord, witnessing when you have an opportunity to do so. And some of the people, they leave there. They call you a religious fanatic. They go home and they say, you know, I work with this guy. He's just lost it all. All he talks about is Jesus. And all he talks about is church and witnessing and, and serving the Lord. And I get so tired of hearing that. But let me tell you something. When the chips is down, you're the first person they want around. They've got confidence in you. 
You built your confidence down there where you were. And here's a man, Mordecai, he just remains faithful. I mean, uh, he's made fun of by Haman. He refuses to bow before him. Haman goes home and he runs him down. And I'm sure that Haman, in his exalted position, probably had a cabinet under him. And probably after a cabinet meeting, they're probably sitting around and they're talking about Mordecai. We need to do something to get rid of him. Uh, he's a rose among, uh, he's a thorn among the rose, uh, and uh, he's upsetting everything. We can't do anything because everybody's looking at him while everybody else is bowing. Uh, uh, he's, he remains standing, uh, and he just, uh, he just won't cater to me. I can hear O'Haven say, no, he's not because he's got some biblical standards and he believes something, and he's going to stay true to his Lord, and that's what every Christian ought to do. They ought to be down on the job what they claim to be by their testimony. And here's a man that just refuses to, uh, refuses to be in. Now listen, when no one else notices, God notices. And I want you to understand, when no one else remembers, God is recording. You keep that, you put that in your pipe and smoke it, it won't give you cancer. You just remember, God is recording, and God's taking notation as you stay faithful to Him. Now, something very interesting says, begins to happen uh, while they're reading to the king. And, there, and the king has said, did we reward Mordecai for saving my life? And they say, no. And about that time, a door opens. And here comes strutting into the king's presence, Mr. Haman. He's come early. Now, the reason he showed up early is because he wants to get the king's attention. Now, evidently, he had such an exalted position that he had access to the king any time he desired to walk in. As we've looked at it previously, under normal circumstances, the only way a person could come into the king's presence is, was if they had been invited into his presence. Evidently, Haman has a cabinet position, cabinet level position, and it enables him to come into the king's presence at any time he wants to. And while they're discussing Mordecai and the king... Uh, remembers all of a sudden uh, through the chronicles that he hasn't rewarded Mordecai. Here comes Haman. And I can just see Haman strutting in with his pride, can't you? I can see him as he struts in uh, and, uh, and, and feels like Mr. Big Shot as he walks down into the presence of the king. And uh, he wants, to, verse number four, reveals that he wants to meet with the king to talk about taking the life of Mordecai. Look at it in verse four. The king said, who's in the court? Now, Haman was coming to the outward court in the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And like a peacock, now he struts in. And he's getting ready to make his case before the king. Here basically is what he's going to say. King, you know, as I come into your presence and as I walk out of your presence, out here is Mordecai. He will not bow down to me. He is, he is going to cause insurrection here in your kingdom because everybody else is bowing and he refuses to bow. And King, you know, this decree has done been signed. And I believe that Mordecai ought to be killed. He ought to be assassinated. I'm sure that's something like Haman was going to say. But it's very interesting as he walks into the presence of the king, the king does not give him opportunity to say anything. The king immediately takes over the conversation. Notice, if you will, please. Verse 6, Haman came in, and the king said unto him, the king said, i got a message for you, mister. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Oh, at this point in time, old weak and Haman is saying, Well, 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 he's going to honor me now. He don't realize that the king is talking about Mordecai. And old Haman walks into the presence of the king, and the king said, Haman, got a question for you. What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? He said, let me ask you a question. <laughs> let me ask you a question, Haman. Just suppose there's somebody in my kingdom that I need to honor. And I really need to do something special for them. What do you think would be good for me to do for them? And I can just hear old Haman's wheels turning in his head. 
man, I am, I'm in the cotton field now. I can just hear him say to himself, I'm going to make it big because he's getting ready to honor me. I'm going to put it on thick. And verse number 6, Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? I am the big wig in this kingdom. I am the big shot. I am the one that's got the promotions. I am the one that the king thinks the world of. I'm the only one in the kingdom that's invited into the presence of the queen and the king. And now the king is so sold on me. He's so struck on me. He wants to know what he can do to honor me. And man, I'm going to put it on thick. I'm going to tell him exactly what he ought to do. And so he begins to tell the king, verse number 7, some things that he ought to do. He seizes the moment. And notice in verse number 8, Let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear. <laughs> here's what I want. That's what he's saying. King, here's what I want. King said, what should I do to honor a man that needs to be honored? Oh, he said, here's what I'd like to have. That's why he's saying so many words. He said, uh, he said uh, first of all, he said, King, I need to be dressed up like you are. You know what this wicked idiot has got in the back of his mind? Assassination. Taking over the king's place. And what he's going to do now, he's going to try to condition himself and position himself to see how it feels to have on the king's guard. King said, what should I do for a man that I want to honor? Mordecai in view. Haman said, well, to himself, well, look, well, King, since you're going to do this for me, I think the first thing you ought to let me do is you ought to let me wear your apparel. Let me put on, the, let me adorn the King's garb. And he said, King, while we're at it, I think that I ought to have your crown appear on my head. Look at it. Notice what he's saying. He's really putting it on big. Verse 8, let the royal apparel be brought, which the King useth to wear. And the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. Then he said, King, here's what I believe you ought to do. You want to honor somebody? Okay. And he said to himself, Boy, am I going to get honored? Need to put your apparel on me. Need to put your crown on my head. And let me ride on your horse. Then he said, King, here's something else we need to do since we're going to do it big. And, and uh, I'm going to be honored. That's what he's saying to himself. He said, uh, This person needs to be set up on that horse. And there needs to be a servant here in your kingdom that will lead that horse down through the streets here of your kingdom. And the person that's leading the horse needs to be a crier. And he needs to be promoting what he's saying me. As I sit up on your horse, wear your crown and wear your garb, this fellow needs to go down the street. And say, here's one that the king is honoring. Here's one that the king is honoring. Look at the last part of verse 9. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Now, can you get this? Can you get this? Get the picture. Oh, Haman thinks, man, I'm going to be sitting up on this horse. I'm going to have the king's crown on my head. I'm going to have his royal apparel on. I'm going to be sitting up on his horse. And somebody down here is going to have the horses, horse the bridle of the horse, and they're going to be, they're going to be marching me, walking me through the city on the back of this horse, and said, "Here's the one that the king desires to honor. Here's the one that the king desires to honor." <laughs> well, he, he thinks he's got it set, don't he? Verse nine: Let the power on the horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Well, he's making it big, isn't he? Do you see what he's doing? Now watch this. Watch this. Very interesting. Very interesting. Watch this. Verse 10, the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. Wow! Don't you know his bubble got bursted? 
Don't you know his balloons got deflated? Don't you know his pride fell down in the bottom of his shoes? Don't you know he said to himself, I can't believe this. I'm the one that's got the exalted position and Mordecai won't even fall down before me when I walk out of the king's presence. And now I have set this thing up for Mordecai and I am going to have to put a key of the crown of the king's crown on Mordecai's head. I'm going to have to put the king's apparel around Mordecai's shoulders. I'm going to have to help him sit up on the king's horse. And notice what happens. He's going to have to get the horse's bridle. And he's going to have to walk the horse through the city. And he's going to have to say as he goes through the city, Here's the man that the king honoreth. Here's the man that the king honoreth. Don't you tell me God don't honor you for being faithful. Don't you tell me God don't look after you when you're faithful to him. Could you imagine that setting for just a minute? Could you imagine, oh, Haman, down inside he's boiling. Down inside he's full of wrath. Down inside he's full of anger. And he's trying to smile through it as he goes down the street. He's trying to say, that's the guy right there. And all along he's wanting to say, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. No, you're not the guy. Uh, the guy you wanted to kill, you're having to honor. Isn't it amazing that God can reverse the tables if he needs to? Hallelujah. That's my God. <laughs> That's my God. And so he paraded Mordecai through the, through the, the streets of the, of, of the, of the kingdom. <laughs> oh, I'd like to have been standing there in the background, wouldn't you? Don't you know, don't you know that he felt like an idiot? And down in his mind all the time, he said, this is the guy I've been trying to kill. Now I'm having to honor him. This is the guy that wouldn't bow down to me, and now I'm having to tell everybody that the king's honoring him. And he's probably saying, man, this is not right. Oh, but I want you to see something here. Old godly Mordecai said to Haman, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. Verse number 12, or look at the last part of verse number 11. Thus shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Verse number 12, And Mordecai came again to the king's gate. And Haman hastened to his house mourning, and having his head covered. Now there's a phrase here, if you mark in your Bible, I want you to mark this. I don't want you to miss this. Because here is a tremendous, tremendous truth that you need to take on with you tonight. It's found in verse number 12. Mordecai came again. To the king's gate. Now listen, Mordecai is being exalted in the kingdom. But he said, Haman, after you put me on display, after I wear the king's crown, after I wear the king's garb, after I sit on the king's horse, after you proclaim to the city that I'm the one that he's honoring, I want you to take me back to my place of responsibility. I want you to take me back where I came from. I want you to take me back. You remember early on, he was exalted to this position. He sat there at the gate. He looked after the business of the city. You know why? He said, I'm just satisfied right back over here where I originally was. He said, I don't want to be exalted unless God chooses to exalt me. You know what happened to Mordecai? Listen closely. He remembered where he came from. The person that God cannot use is the person that thinks that God's program can advance without him. Here's a person that returns after he is exalted through the streets of the city. He returns back to the gate of the city because he wanted to remember the ditch he was dug out of and not forget where he came from. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter what your state in life may be, no matter how well you get along in life, and no matter how exalted life may be for you, don't ever forget where you came from. 
Don't ever forget your morals. Let me say secondly, don't ever forget where God's brought you to. It is God that has done the things in your life that's been accomplished. Mordecai, I must have said to Haman, must have said to Haman, Haman, when this is over with, just drop me off where you pick me up. Hallelujah. What a person that is. I've met some people through my travels and uh, through my preaching and through these years of ministry. I've met some people that God has greatly used and continues to greatly use. They've got all kinds of degrees. They can go anywhere they want to go. They can preach anywhere they want to preach. But they're just an old humble shoe. They recognize if it were not for the grace of God upon their lives, they'd be absolutely nothing. And that's the reason God used them. I've met some other people that they went off and they've got good training and it's gone to their head. They think they are a little deeper in prophecy than other people. They think they know more history than other people. They think they know more about theological truths than other people. And they kind of demean you and they, you get in their presence, they kind of look down on you. But God don't use that. Because the Bible says that pride goes before destruction. I love to be around people that recognize, there's a song that said, Had it not been. We don't ever want to forget that. Had it not been for God's grace, had it not been for God's goodness, I don't ever want to forget the fact that I ought to be in hell. But I'm going to heaven. I don't ever want to forget that. I don't ever want to forget the fact that God didn't find me elevated in a spiritual position. God found me dead in trespasses and sin. I don't ever want to get over that. I want to remember where God found me and where God brought me to. I want to be like old Mordecai. When it's all said and done, take me back to the gate. Just take me back to the gate and drop me off there, and I'll be satisfied with that. And when he did that, verse number 12, Haman took off for home. I want you to understand, if you can picture this in your mind, he don't walk in like he did back in chapter 5. Back in chapter 5, verses 11 and following, he goes home and he's bragging on everything. He's bragging on his children. He's bragging on his money. He's bragging on the exaltation of his position. Well, this time he don't go home bragging. This time he probably, like a snake, kind of crawls under the door as he goes in. Can't you just hear him as he goes in whining? Can't you just hear him as he goes in and he says, you are not going to believe what happened to me today. I walked into the king's presence and he said, what should I do for a man I want to honor? And I thought he was going to honor me and I told him what to do. And you're not going to believe this, but he honored the man that I've been coming home complaining about. And I had to walk his horse through the street. And I had to tell the people in the city, here's the man that God honors. Can't you just hear him? You know, if he'd really been right with God and he wanted to do what was right, you know what he would have done? I believe he would have gone home and said, God taught me a vital lesson today. God tried to get my attention today. God tried to straighten me out today. I've been humbled through what God's done today. God uh, took the wind out of my sails today. God today exalted my enemy. God today put me down because God is trying to get my attention. But he didn't do that. I'm sure he went home murmuring and complaining and said, You know what? I've been done wrong today. Isn't that what most of us say? When things don't go right, isn't it most of the time somebody else's fault? Now, come on. Come on. Happens in church sometimes, doesn't it? Well, they, or he, or she, or them. It happens on the job, too. If he hadn't said that. <laughs> you ever heard that? 
if he hadn't said that, if he hadn't done that, if the company hadn't treated me this way, I think I'll just not give them a good day's work. They just, they're not treating me right. Wait a minute. Listen to me. Listen to me. Before you work for the people you're employed for, you're working for God. Before, before you in that home find your place of responsibility as a husband and his wife and his children, your first place of responsibility is to your master. And how you treat them is the same as if you treated him that way. Are you with me? As unto the Lord. The Bible's very clear on that. When he goes home and he's giving the riot act, he's telling his wife and friends. Notice the Bible says that verse number 13, he told Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends. Now, his friends had probably been over there to help, come over there to help him celebrate uh, his wonderful, exalted position in the king's in the king's cabinet, and he comes in with this report, and he says, "I just can't believe it. The guy that I've been trying to kill has been exalted. I can't believe it." Of course, I'm sure he places the blame on everybody. And this is Mother's Day, and I think this fits in real well right here. He looks at his wife. And he said, you know, all the promises I've promised you, we're going to build a bigger house and <laughs> we're going to get maid service. Might already have it here. Man, we, we're set for life. But you're not going to believe what the king, the king has exalted Mordecai and he's putting me down. You know what his wife said? He's probably going to kill you. Boy, that's real good coming from your wife, isn't it? Sounds like Job's wife, doesn't it? Notice what's happening here in verse number 13. Haman told Zeresh his wife, all his friends, everything that had befallen him, that said his wife, then said his wise men, and Zeresh his wife unto him, Mordecai, I be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall. Thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. You go home and get some encouragement from your wife, and she says they're going to take your life. That's not getting very good encouragement, is it? <laughs> you, go, you, go, you go home to your wife and say, honey, man, it's been a rough day. She said, it's going to get rougher. You go home and say to your wife, you're not going to believe this. I didn't get my exaltation today. She said, sounds to me like you're going to be checking out tomorrow. Man, I'm telling you, that's tough, isn't it? And while she, while Haman is in his house telling his wife and his friends what's happening, and how he was mistreated, and how he was abused, and he didn't get exalted, and the very guy he's trying to kill got to ride through the street with the king's apparel, comes a knock on his door. And the servants of the king are standing at the door in verse number 12, king's chamberlains. They said, we come to tell you, you remember last night that the king has asked Esther what he can give her even to the half of his kingdom. And they have established another banquet for tonight. And tonight it's going to be the king, between the king and Esther and Mordecai and you, Haman. And they're waiting for you. The banquet is ready, and the king has told me to come and get you and bring you to the banquet. I'm sure that as Haman walked out of his house, he looked at that 75-foot-tall gallus that his wife told him to construct in order that Haman might take the life of Mordecai. And I'm sure that he's going to the banquet in fear and in trembling. He's not going with the same feeling he had 24 hours previous to that. His number's coming up. I want to, I want to give you a few principles here. Just want to take just a few minutes and we're going. 
Listen closely. There's some principles here that become self-evident. There's an old saying in life that goes something like this. Not in the Bible. I've had people to tell me this is in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. But the principle's there. What goes around comes around. God will have the last say. I want you to understand that God's righteousness will be enthroned. And there's nothing in the world that anyone can do to change that fact. And what appears right here, what appears to be a tragedy is about to be turned into a triumph for the man that has stood faithful to God. When I was studying this, I ran across a story in closing that I, I think it illustrates the point. True story goes something like this. A man was shipwrecked. Somehow he ended up on this island. And he, he ended up with a few of his personal possessions that floated in in the water over in the sand. And he went out and he's standing out here. He just barely salvaged his life. And he's went out here and he's picking his things that's floating around in the water and he's picking it up. And he takes it over here on this little island. And he keeps looking out across the water to see if he can see a ship, see if he can see anybody that will help him. And there's nobody in sight. And days pass by. And he finally takes some of the crude material there on that island and he builds him just a little lean-to hut. And he takes what few personal possessions he salvaged and he put those personal possessions inside of that hut. And he's living there by himself. Every day he looks out across the water to see if he can see a ship, see if he can see somebody that's trying to come and rescue it. But nobody shows up. He's by himself. Every day he has to go out and find food and, 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 uh, and, and get something to, to, to sustain his physical life. So on a particular day, he went out to try to find some food. He was gone for a while and he killed something and he was bringing it back and on the way back, he noticed that there was a smoke close to where he was staying. And when he got back, something had happened. He'd left something the way it shouldn't have been left or whatever. And the little old lean-to that he was living in with all of his personal possessions had caught on fire. And not only did he lose his lean-to, but he lost all of his personal possessions. It was all burned up. And now he stands there with absolutely nothing but the clothes on his back. The few things he had salvaged from the shipwreck, <clears throat> they're now burned up. The little lean-to's burned up, and all he's looking at is a bunch of ashes. And he's saying to himself, how much worse can this become than this? It was late in the evening, and he just found him a rock for a pillar. And he laid down beside of the ashes of all of the last possessions he had on this earth. He rolled and tumbled over the rock there on the ground through the night. Finally got to sleep late in the morning hours. And he awakened. And when he awakened, the first thing he saw, a ship had anchored out in the waters off of the coast where he was. And as he's looking at that ship anchored out there, he hears the footsteps of someone and he looks around, and coming out of the woods was the captain of the ship. And he said, early this morning was traveling across these waters. I'm about to have a shout and spell, because this is the way God works. He said, was out in the ocean traveling across these waters. And he said, we saw the smoke coming up off this island. And he said, we followed that smoke here. We've come to rescue you. He had to lose it all to get help. But I want you to understand, sometimes that's the way God works. But when you think you've lost it all, and when you think there's nowhere to turn, and you think there's no way out, and you have to jump up to touch bottom, I want you to understand something. God is on the throne, and he's on his way. 
my daughter. Just as I came out of the officer's teacher's meeting tonight, going in my office, she brought her camera. She showed me some pictures. She went by her mother's grave. She and family went by her mother's grave today. And had her picture sitting there on the tombstone and had her mama's uh, date of birth and her promotion date there. Showed her there. She went by there today. And I got to thinking, there's always been some tough times in life. And it's still tough. And if I was God, I'd do things different. But it's none of my business how He does things. There's some tough times. I've been through them. It's difficult. You've been through tough times. And if we hang around here long, there's going to be some more of them. But when everything that you've got is consumed, God's power, God's strength, God's mercy is not diminished one iota. God's power, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace still continues to flow from the throne of glory. No more to chaos. Didn't get exalted, but Haman did. Mordecai is made fun of in the kingdom. Haman ceased at that. Mordecai is going to be assassinated. So Haman thinks. But God said, I've got some promises down there on that group of people. My promises to that people is not going to be canceled. I'm going to make sure my people survive. So he gives a king a sleepless night just to hear the record. And the wheels of God are set in motion. And a kingdom is saved. And the Jews are spared. Because one sleepless king sent for the minutes of the previous meetings. And a whole kingdom is turned in another direction. One of the presidents of the United States, I'm thinking it was Truman, was at Blair House in Washington. He was asleep. And while Truman was sleeping at the Blair House, two men slipped in through some Secret Service agents with the intent of killing the president. Fortunately, a couple of the Secret Service agents were attentive to some noise coming from a particular room. And they moved in that direction. And gunfire ensued in the Blair House. When it was over with, one of the Secret Service agents was killed. To the day he died, Truman on several occasions said, It is hard for me to conceive that somebody would die for me. I stand here tonight utterly amazed. It's unbelievable to, but unbelievable to me that a perfect God would love Him perfect humanity to the extent that He'd go to hell for us. But hallelujah. He took our place. It's hard for me to believe, like the president, that somebody would die for me. Well, I'm sure glad he did. And I want to be thankful for it, don't you? I want him to know that I love him because he first loved me. Father, I love you tonight. And I thank you for loving me. And I thank you for loving these dear folks. And Lord, as we bow before you tonight, we want to say thank you. 
Thank you, Lord, for the sufficiency of your grace, the power of your mercy, the goodness of your love, the graciousness of your sacrifice. Lord, don't let us ever get past that. Don't let us get over that. I ask of you tonight to rekindle a new love in our soul for you, that we might love you supremely in all that we do. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. Because we ask in Jesus' name. If you need to come to this altar as we stand together, if God's speaking to you about any of that, make your way down here. If others need to come, just come on as we stand together. Do what the Lord would lead you to do. Sing in a stanza of invitation. If you need to make your way down here, would you come?